Welcome back to the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this afternoon with Legislative Council to go through a draft strike all amendment to S25. Um, it can be found on our committee page under today's date and under uh, the name Michelle Childs. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you for your work on this. And if you could take us through what's contained in here, it should sound familiar to committee members because we've talked conceptually about all of this. And there are probably a few decision points and a few, um, uh, I think, perhaps giving you a little bit more guidance um, that, that we'll need to do while we go through the bill here. And then it, I'm hoping that we're narrowing in on some final language. So welcome. Thanks. Um, so I did highlight a language that indicates where it's different from the Senate version. So uh, starting in section one, so this is with regard to the regulation by local government. And you will recall that the Senate version had a date in the future that essentially if, if a town had not taken a vote, they would be considered to have opted in and that's taken out. And so the only uh, part that remains in section one is just this te technical amendment, just clarifying that when you created this section last year and you were talking about a town needing to vote to approve retail sales, you were talking about it, the retail portion of the integrated licensee, not necessarily the whole integrated license. Um, so section two, so this is moving down to Cannabis Control Board Advisory Committee. And uh, so you'll see at the top of page two, the Senate version had language in there allowing the, a, a board member to be removed by a two thirds vote of the advisory committee and that's been removed. Um, but you retained the language um, that's on lines five and six that's clarifying that the board should adopt rules uh, through the APA process um, that define the basis and the process for removal of a board member. So going to uh, the list of folks on the advisory committee, um, you'll see on top of page three, uh, you're substituting the chair of the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council or designee for the member with an expertise in substance misuse prevention appointed by the Senate Committee on Committees. And as the vice chair mentioned, um, you know, I think it makes sense to have the it equal between House and Senate appointees. And so we've just changed subdivision I out for the expertise in municipal issues instead of the treasurer, it would be the Senate Committee on Committees doing that appointment. And then you'll see on line 16, adding the chair of the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee or designee. And I just, uh, on that issue, there's another section I'll show you. And I think there's some decisions that have to be made there about whether or not to, uh, like I had changed the name, like for resurrecting this committee, I kind of changed the name a little bit. Um, and so you, you'll want to talk about that, but we can do it when we get to the later section there, but we'll just want to make sure it's the same. Um, subdivision two. So when you initially passed this, they, the board was supposed to have the advisory committee, uh, the appointments to be made by May 1st, all the, all the varying uh, appointing authorities. Um, and so uh, that obviously is impossible to happen. And so that's been moved out to July 1st. Um, so uh, just bumped out two months to accommodate the late start of, the, of getting the board, the board appointed. So page four, Cannabis Control Board. Um, I'm going to skip over the sections you're not changing unless somebody tells me or has that you'd like to talk about it or has a question. So com committee members, Sorry. let me uh, defer to you. Do you want to have more of a fine tooth comb here or are you comfortable with the fact that we have already reviewed the, the things that are not highlighted? 
nobody's expressing an opinion. So I think we'll just continue to go through the highlighted changes. Okay. And I can just mention what they are that way it keys people into it. Yep. So the section, section three is just adding advertising review fees um, to what goes into the fund because that's you're adding all the advertising language in. Uh, section four is amending Act 164. Um, and this hasn't changed. So most of the language is just what the Senate did because you, it's, it's paired with the next section having to do with the Joint Fiscal Committee looking at the fees instead of the, the report back to the legislature. Um, something that I, um, and I haven't talked to the vice chair about this, but I just added in there was that, um, so you see this date is already passed, um, but uh, initially the board was supposed to come to you by April 1st of this year with a proposal for positions and funding, et cetera, for FY 22 and 23. And I just thought for purposes of this, considering where we're at with the board, just trying to play catch up, um, just, you know, they're, they, they are coming to you right now, basically with the, with the FY 22. 22 stuff because they've asked you for those two new positions. And my understanding is that because of the late start of the board, you don't need an additional appropriation for those two positions. And then in terms of what they're gonna do for, for funding FY22, I don't think you necessarily need that. I mean, you, you do 22, but 23 will come along. I don't think you need to worry too much about that. And I think it just, it makes it really hard for, uh, I think, the chair to be able to look out to 2023 right now and get it to you and said, you know, because it's all, they're already behind schedule. So that was just my suggestion is just for this, you just have it for this year, which is what he's working on anyway. That makes sense. Thank you. So uh, page seven, um, section 4A, no changes to this section um, and you know ways and means will be working on this in more detail but this is the uh, alternative to what you had in act 164 with the board reporting to you on suggested fees um, by april 1st is now it would be uh doing it to the joint fiscal committee september 1st and there to basically be a dialogue between the two and that the fees on a temporary basis would be approved by joint fiscal committee, those would at least get the program off the ground and going. And then what's going to happen is it's just going to revert to the normal process where the administration, you know, proposes the fees and then the legislature adopts the fees and the fee bill. So page nine, um, section 4B, this is a new section, um, new reporting section, um, just to make sure that Cannabis Control Board has a busy summer. Um, is uh, So on or before November 1st, uh, and the date you'll see sometimes with this November is because um, I think I've got in a couple different places, is because you're gonna be in the second year of the biennium, so you have earlier drafting uh, deadlines for that. And, um, and so you want to make sure that you're getting that information um, early enough so that you have time to look at it, consider it, talk to uh, me or whoever and develop legislation anticipation of January. You don't want it coming in in January. Um, so there to report to you on recommendations as to whether integrated licensees and product manufacturer licensees should be permitted to produce solid concentrate products with greater than 60% THC, as long as they're incorporating them into other products that otherwise comply with the prohibited products section that you adopted last year. And then the second one is recommendations developed in consultation with the Agency of Agriculture as to whether the board should permit hemp or CBD to be converted to Delta 9 THC, and if so, how they, how they should regulate that. That should sound familiar to folks. Section 4C, this is the creation of the two new positions. So two new permanent positions in the Cannabis Control Board, uh, one full-time exempt general counsel, and one full-time classified administrative assistant positions. 
And as I mentioned, and, and you might have heard from uh, the chair as well, uh, they think they can, uh, at, at this point right now, absorb that within their budget because, um, because of the late start of the board. So advertising, I have not, you didn't make any changes to the advertising, uh, likely because it's your language that you passed out a committee last year. So you're pretty familiar with it already. And uh, so I'm just going to skip over that. So I'm going to move down um, and just talking about, uh, just to note that it's there, is that on page 20, you have the cultivation piece. That's where um, between August 1st and October 1st of next year, when you have integrated licensees that uh, will have applied in the spring for an integrated and are selling to the public probably between those dates, but without any competition from retail, from retail licenses at that point, that um, during that time, 25% of any cannabis flowers sold by an integrated licensee should be obtained from licensed small cultivators, if available. That makes sense, thank you. Yep. Um, next is on social equity, so section 11. So when reporting to the General Assembly regarding fees for licensing, um, and you know what, is I, what I realized that I need to tweak that just in the next version. And instead of section five, we're gonna reference the new sec, we're, we're gonna reference the new section because that's gonna be where the board is gonna be working with joint fiscal committee. So I need to tweak that, but essentially they're gonna be looking at reduced or eliminated fees for folks who have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis prohibition or individuals directly and personally impacted by prohibition. Uh, section 12 is just uh, creation of the new chapter for cannabis social equity programs um, and the establishment of the Cannabis Business Development Fund. If you look at page 24 and you're looking at what the uh, fund is to be used for, and you'll see the new subdivision three, which is to assist with job training and technical assistance for social equity applicants. The next section in section 988 on social equity loans and grants, I've added the language that was recommended by ACCD. So you'll see that starting on line tw on 20, uh, the agency may procure by contract all or part of the necessary underwriting execution and administration services required for the loans and grants um, to be eligible social equity applicants as allowed under this chapter. Should the agency be unable to do so, uh, the program shall not move forward until the General Assembly appropriates the operational resources necessary for the agency to make those loans and grants available. Next is section 13, social equity applicants and uh, the, and so I think actually now looking at this section 13, I would probably tweak the title a little bit because of the change there. So what it would be is that the Cannabis Control Board in consultation with the advisory committee, but also ACCD and the executive director of racial equity are to develop the criteria. Oops, and I have that twice. Um, hasn't been through editing yet. I was working furiously this morning, <laughs> multitasking. So uh, if you make any more changes and we'll, we'll send it through editing and get a clean copy for you as soon as we can. So I think I would just tweak the, the title there and then just the little typo that I have there. But essentially it's gonna, it's the addition of ACCD and the executive director of racial equity are gonna be working on the criteria for the social equity applicants. Section 14 is, uh, is uh, the money, the appropriation. There's no changes to that. You recall for the Cannabis Business uh, Development Fund, there's $500,000 appropriation to that fund. And then it's also made up of, uh, of up to, is it $50,000? 
50, I think $50,000 for each integrated licensee would pay uh, uh, into that fund. And so you have like a potential starting out of $750,000 in that fund. And this is just the straight up appropriation from the general fund. Page 26, uh, medical cannabis program. Um, the member is that in Act 164, it's supposed to move over from the Department of Public Safety on March 1st of next year. Senate changed it to July 1st of this year, and y'all are proposing January 1st of next year. So uh, a, a couple months earlier than, than was proposed. And so they will be operating under the old statutes or, or current statutes and rules until those two months later when everything else kind of takes effect. Next, there's a new section uh, 16A, and this is where I was kind of thinking through about uh, what the oversight committee might look like in this new world. And so I just called it the Medical Cannabis Oversight Advisory Panel. Um, I was trying to get away from, so we have the board, we have the advisory committee. And then now I thought I was trying to come up with another word for a board committee panel so that we don't get confused between them all. And then I think when I wasn't in committee this morning, um, perhaps the vice chair started to talk to you about the makeup and of that committee and, and issues because when we we're taking a look at it, it, it's clearly dated in the sense that it was created um, you know, a decade ago when there was a greater, where cannabis was illegal across the board other than the medical program and, um, and hadn't been even decriminalized at that point. And so it's pretty heavy on the law enforcement end of things. Um, and so the question now is how do you make that, how do you retain that committee? Because I understand that there's a strong interest in, in having some version of that committee continue, but perhaps not necessarily in exactly the same makeup or duties or, or things like that because the cannabis field has evolved so much over the last decade. So I just put a placeholder there and maybe I'll just finish walking through the rest of the bill and then we can come back to anything y'all wanna come back to, if that's okay. Sounds good, thank you. So next is highway safety and uh, Senate put this in because the governor had mentioned it in his letter when he didn't sign uh, Act 164, um, so we wanted something in there, but I think, you know, the funding is, I think, fairly, I think, uh, settled from, from a, you know, federal grant perspective, um, and so Section 17 here is what you have, as you'll see, that this is amending existing law in Title 20 under the Criminal Justice Training Council, and you'll see the language that struck. It says right now, on or before December 31st of this year, law enforcement officers shall receive a minimum of 16 hours of training. Um, and uh, this bumps it out and says on or before December 31st of 2026, law enforcement officers shall be receive the training. folks remember that discussion from earlier today, um, I think it's worth just considering for a moment that um, we heard pretty clearly from the Criminal Justice Council that, um, that it would take them, I think, a significant um, effort and uh, appropriation to accelerate the timeline. Um, because it's not just a matter of, um, uh, it's not just a matter of, of of revamping, you know, the basic training, it's actually a, a matter of them needing to add more instructor time, you know, at the pace that they're currently uh, able to do this training. Um, that's, this is how long it will take them. And if there's a, uh, a need to do it faster, um, it's going to require them to train the trainers and accelerate that pace. Rep. Pihovsky? Did we hear at all how they would prioritize who gets trained and in what order? I don't know that they talked about that. Rep. Gannon, did they? Um, 
Uh, they didn't really talk about priority prioritization. I mean, there are several training, a right trainings every year. Um, and there's approximately a thousand law enforcement officers that don't have a right training right now. 500 of those don't have a DUI certification, which you really need before you should take your A-RIDE training. Um, but one of the things they did mention is not people who should be prioritized, but people who, who may not um, need the training because of their position or who may not be able to qualify for A-RIDE training. And these are people like the investigators in the Office of Professional Regulation, the investigators in the Attorney General's office, which are technically law enforcement officers, um, but aren't you know, out patrolling our streets or in highways and aren't doing roadside stops. Um, so I have reached out to Cindy Patch Taylor to see if there's a carve out for those people, but I have not heard back from her at this point. Great, thanks. My, my concern is simply if we have people, you know, we know we have inequity based into our systems and if we have people without best practice training making calls, like I just, it gives me pause, so. Okay, I'm gonna um, move on. So next sections have to do with the substance misuse prevention funding. In Act 164, it was session law, it was not codified. Section 18 is codifying that language. Um, and section 19 is repealing the session law. And then the effective dates are not changed. So. All right. So I think with respect to um, giving any final instructions before we send a, a, what we think is a final draft off to editing, um, we wanted to come back to talk a little bit about the cannabis, medical cannabis oversight panel um, and whether it makes sense to recommend uh, some changes to that now and then are there any other sections that folks wanted to talk about? Mr. Vice Chair, is there anything else that we didn't get done that you would like us to talk about now before we go to- No, no Madam Chair, except for the, um, the thing I just mentioned about the Vermont Criminal Justice Council and getting a carve out. And I, I should just add for Representative Vihoski's um, it, it, re, related to that question, um, the Department of Public Safety is also supposed to report um, to the General Assembly about the, um, the geographical diversity of A-RIDE training so that we have A-RIDE um, trained law enforcement officers across the state. So they do that in March of 2022. Um, so that is, is a report that will come back to us. Um, I don't know if it goes directly to your question, but at least it goes to the question of where we're a ride officers will be. Yeah. Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair. If it's okay, I wanted to go back to the uh, discussion about the advisory panel, I think is the way Michelle uh, renamed it. Um, the one that uh, has a, a, a legacy, if you like, uh, arguably heavy representation by law enforcement. And I, I wanted to remind uh, my colleagues, you all, I was particularly fetched and I tried to, uh, I admit being clumsy, trying to find a place for the young lady this morning who's an RN who talked to me uh, in very compelling fashion that the kind of expertise uh, involved in formulating for a patient a uh, cannabis regime that works is a, a very specialized uh, skill and rarely found. And I don't know where to uh, emphasize that the board uh, should really uh, access that kind, uh, particularly after the medical marijuana and the retail systems are merged. And I thought, well, uh, again, uh, admittedly clumsily, where, where would that kind of um, representation or access 
uh, to that skill be most valuable to this whole enterprise? Maybe the panel. I just found the testimony this morning very compelling, and I haven't figured out where it is uh, that a person like herself, not necessarily her, but from the Nurses Association, who has that expertise, what role would that kind of person play and where in this structure? Michelle, do you have a, a thought on, um, on changing the makeup of this advisory panel? Well, I was just gonna suggest that, and I know you don't love the screen sharing, but that I, sh I pop up the current law with regard to that oversight committee so you could see what it looks like because, um, and then it help who you sub out. Um, because I think that that is what uh, Representative Anthony mentioned. It, it does make the most sense that it would go into on this oversight committee. And, but I think you wanna look at who's on there now. Um, would, is that? Yep. Or? Let's see if we can get our meeting host. There you go. Now you have it. Okay. Um, sorry, I've been um, too many tabs open. Okay, can everybody see that? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're in uh, Title 18, Section 44J, 7474J. Um, so establishing the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. So you see the, the, the current members. So one res registered patient appointed by each dispensary. So you would have, so you have five patients, um, a registered nurse, and a registered patient appointed by the governor. Um, so a physician appointed by the medical society, a member of a local zoning board appointed by the league. And then you have law enforcement um, appointed, local law enforcement on E and then state law enforcement on F. Um, so, uh, So I don't know. So Rep Representative Anthony, were you saying that uh, it should be, or was your proposal that it should be someone from this, like a particular organization of I, cannabis I, I, caregivers? Or, I mean, you, there's a lot of things you could, you know, do on here in the sense that you could actually, doesn't have to be a medical professional. You can appoint care, somebody who's a registered caregiver on the registry. You could also appoint somebody from this nursing group or, you know, I mean, I think I, there are things you can do here. I was, I certainly agree. Uh, and I thought we agreed already to include a caregiver with life experience in this area, like one of our um, um, uh, testifiers this morning. The other who, young lady- Who would, appoint, who would yeah. appoint that caregiver? Wow. Um, I almost think the organization to which the other young lady, the RN, she, if I remember correctly, she was not only a vice president of the um, ANA for Vermont, but she also, I thought, was a member of a specialized group having to do with cannabis. And I, I've lost her, her title, so to say, in my mind. But my point is that group to which she belongs might be the good appointing uh, body for the uh, caregiver slash life experience patient or cannabis, um, a person familiar with cannabis therapy. I mean, another thing is, is that, you know, you could look at having the board or, uh, 
do you know do appointments as well you don't necessarily have to 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 uh go elsewhere you know like go outside and have you know i'm sure oh. be consulting with with these different groups and figuring out so if it's easier and now that you've gone through the existing list i share my colleagues puzzlement with the um numerous public safety folks, uh, PD folks, and the zoning uh, uh, administrator or zoning position, I, that seems anomalous. One is too much and the other is anomalous. And so that frees up a couple of spots, which I would think from the therapeutic community, the caregiver community, the lived experience community, um, ought to actually bring that roster into contemporary relevance, that would be my thought. But you're right, who's the appointing authority? I, I suppose probably the board, uh, as you suggest. I don't know how to, how to uh, nudge the um, choice to that universe of folks who are very familiar with cannabis therapy, either because they're a patient or because they are an administrator of that therapy. Um, any other thoughts on that from committee members? I'm cognizant that this is um, skirting close to the policy areas that, that would be more uh, human services committee related. And so I, um, you know, I don't really want us to get into completely reconfiguring this, um, this board in a vacuum. And so I I recognize you probably can't see me because we're no. screen sharing. Um, yep, go right ahead. I share um, Representative Anthony's concerns. The other thing I really heard this morning that I worry isn't adequately represented here is the, the cost, the healthcare cost. Um, and I wanna find, and, and I don't know how, but a way to ensure that we're bringing not only the people who can afford to use dispensaries, but the individuals who cannot, do not have the privilege to afford the thousands of dollars a month that it costs to use the dispensaries. I think that as we're discussing therapeutic use, we need to discuss healthcare cost. So I wonder, here's a suggestion. I wonder if we might go ahead with the naming or the renaming, um, but that we leave for an amendment um, to the bill when it comes to the floor that, that a subset of our committee might work collaboratively with the Human Services Committee to, um, to, to offer on the makeup of this panel. Um, you know, they didn't hear the same testimony that we did, uh, but but we could certainly develop, um, you know, Rep. Svihovsky and Anthony, if you were interested in being the, the captains of this project, you could certainly develop a recommendation, um, bring it back to us, and then take it to the Human Services Committee and, and see if they feel comfortable with it. And that way, if... Um, you know that that will keep us more in the realm of this is this is the policy area of our committee but we heard compelling testimony and we'd like to we'd like to have you tell us what you think does that make sense it does so we should figure out uh on how to nuance the membership issue which is the policy side how would tanya's issue about trying to suggest where uh, cost sharing, subsidy, I, I don't know how you, how you would configure this. How would that financial assistance to participants be, where would that go or where would that come up or how would that be advanced? I don't think that it's necessarily the place of this oversight committee to, uh, to, to 
be the keeper of some form of financial aid or financial help. But I think if we put if we put voices in that mix that represent the registered caregivers, the people who are growing for other people, they are going to know, you know, that it's, the, you know, the reason they're growing for another person as, as the nurse this morning told us is that uh, they, the people she grows for uh, can't afford to buy retail at one of the dispensaries. So you know, if we can add a couple of those perspectives and um, Representative Gannon and then uh, Michelle's got a, a thought on that as well. Just to note what one of the duties of the Oversight Committee is, is to, um, is to make recommendations um, concerning the effectiveness of the registered dispensaries individually and together and serving the needs of qualified patients and registered care caregivers, including the provision of educational and support services. I mean, perhaps that language could be tweaked a little to get to the cost. That, that's really almost spot on. Thank you, John. Hmm. Okay. Michelle? Um, I was just going to mention um, there are parts of the statute. Remember, this statute is, is currently in effect and will the existing one and until March 1st. So that oversight committee is going to exist until then. Um, there's the makeup of the board, but there's also probably some little tweaks that should be made to, or, or, or you know, more thinking about what that oversight committee is gonna do in light of the fact of the changing landscape, because one of the things that it says is, you know, putting, uh, it says something around there, putting safeguards and making sure that only people who have, are on the registry have access to cannabis, you know, which is, you know, right. Yeah. There's other things. So I think there, I think that section should, I, I have a little pause about adopting that section new um, with language that you may not be wanting in six months or something. And so I just put it out there for you to consider is that because that, that oversight committee can still keep meeting, you know, and exist through March, um, you know, you do, you can spend some more time during the off season and uh, put, you know, have a proposal ready to go in January and we can just put it on budget adjustment or, you know, something that's moving quickly that there wouldn't necessarily need to be a real disruption, but I think that there's going to be some disruption regardless, because if you're going to change the makeup of those committees, right? So it's like in some ways, it's actually cleaner if you repeal the old, that goes away. And then even if just, you know, a week later, the new board, the new advisory panel comes into being based on legislation you pass at the first half of 2022, you know, and it could be some of the exact same people, right? And, and, and a lot of the same charge, but more accurately reflect what you want them to do now as opposed to how they were envisioned 10 years ago. Yeah. And so I just kind of, I don't, you know, you can certainly move ahead with, with enacting something in this and just changing the membership. But I guess maybe I kind of feel like it's because you're enacting a new statute uh, do you really want to enact a new statute that has things in there that you don't really like? Right. It's a it's a larger project. Right. Uh, Rep. Dehovsky. My question is not related to this, so I will. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you. I is it does it make any sense <clears throat> for us to anticipate when we would have ready a replacement section and simply put a sunset in, in this statute, in this le legislation, so that the existing section has an expiration already set. And literally then we already know when we have to have formulated the replacement uh, body, membership and section. I think, I think under normal circumstances, that would make sense, but because you have a statute that's gonna be in effect until March 1st, you wouldn't yeah. adopt something now that is in effect for two, you know what I mean? Like have one thing until March 1st, have something for two months and then change it on July 1st. Okay, I got you. So. Yeah. You're right, okay. 
Anyone else on this topic? Do we have a sense of how we're moving forward? I mean, if it's important to you, and I, and I know the, I think the, the chair of the board uh, testified about the value of the, of the oversight committee. And I think there's certainly interest on this committee about moving forward. Instead of actually adopting new statutory language in order to signal to people that you, you, you're not failing to address this issue, you're, you're coming back with a more thorough proposal is I can just add a little something in that section saying uh, that you know it's the General Assembly's intent to establish this panel and ask the board to you know to suggest uh, recommendations to you about the composition and, and duties of that panel in the fall if that would be helpful. Or, I mean, it doesn't, it's not necessary. I was just kind of saying at least you can address it and, and people might feel more comfortable. I think that makes sense. I totally agree. Because <clears throat> it really plants the flag for a, a revisiting of that whole section and the board and its function and membership. All right, uh, Rip Yehovsky. Um, I did want to come back to the social equity section. I feel pretty strongly that adding a task in here of reporting back the percentages of minorities that are taking part and, and actually being supported by this so that we can look at it and see, is it working? Do we need to make changes? What are the barriers that still exist at a later point is really important. I know I, I spoke to this a little bit more this morning. I think it was this morning, maybe it was earlier this afternoon. Well, and legislative council has been in and out because of her other duties as well. So um, if you wanna speak a little bit more about what you're looking for, that might give her a better sense of what. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so what I'm hoping to see in, I'm looking, I don't know if it would be an additional task um, or an additional space we could use the fund. But what I'd like to see is some sort of date for a report that really looks at um, indiv individuals who've been harmed by prohibition, people of color, women, the groups that were really trying to help with the social equity fund and reporting back, you know, are they accessing it? What are the barriers that still exist? What is the percentage of these groups that are actually owning these businesses and really so that we can not say, hey, we did it and it's done, but recognition that this is an ongoing process and that we're gonna learn, learn from what we're doing now and make changes in the future based on that information, if that makes sense. And what do you have, are you envisioning that this would be a report from the board or from ACCD because they're administering the, the loans and grants or? Uh, they would do it collaboratively or? Um, I'm, I think those are good questions. There is within this, I'm, I'm trying to scroll through really quickly and I'm kind of losing my place. There, We've set up a social equity advisory committee, yes? Or am I making that up in... Sorry. Well, there is, the, it's, the, it's the board working with the board's advisory committee, which is that wide ranging group of folks and ACCD and the director of racial equity. These are the four entities or, or persons who are coming up with the criteria for who qualifies as a social equity applicant. Um, you know, so, I mean, you could have the, you know, the board in consultation with those other three mm -hmm. Uh, coming back to you with just some, uh, and I, I think, un unless you guys, which I'm totally fine if you want to dictate to me the specific data points you want to hear. Otherwise, I think on, from my part, I would just kind of use some general language on coming back to you with information on how the program has been rolled out and, and who's applied and who's getting the loans and the grants and recommendations for tweaks to the, you know, to the program, things like that, and just have it real general. Again, I have a lot of confidence in 
the the chair of the board. I think, you know, he's well steeped in these issues and I think he's going to be on top of it. So I don't feel as though you have to be extremely prescriptive, but. Yeah, I think that that group sort of working in conjunction or would be fine. I think the other way that I could see it going would be designating it to the office of the director of racial equity. I know they're bringing on an, an someone to do research, but I think that your original proposal of really having it be the board in conjunction with the, the Office of Racial Equity and ACCD would be fine. I think the one piece in addition to the sort of thing, the general language you have given me that I would like to see is the identification of barriers that continue to exist for um, social equity applicants. Okay. All right. Representative Anthony. Thank you. Um, I, I just would suggest <clears throat> that while um, resisting being prescriptive in terms of the actual uh, uh, measurements is wise and leave it to the board, I would suggest that you what you really uh, need in the end is something that you can track over time that is, is a quantitative metric that does reflect the um, um, excess of those identified communities who are participating compared to the potential universe of folks who could have participated but aren't. So you end up with percentages. And, and the other quantitative metric is, so what's, what's the average uh, assistance um, for people uh, essentially uh, who are applicants for license uh, compared to the perceived need of those folks in order to succeed. It's sort of making a judgment of whether you've, been, you've adequately helped. And as Tanya says, uh, how about the people that you have failed to reach? Uh, what's your strategy for essentially succeeding in improving those metrics into the future? That, the, just off the top of my head. But I think quantitative data that you can track over time is really important. Other questions, comments, suggestions on this topic or any others? All right. Um, so Michelle, I feel like we are at the point where, where we've given direction and guidance on, uh, on final edits and are ready to give you a break to go um, make those changes and send this off to editing. Um, what is the time frame? How long, how long of a break should we take in committee um, to allow for that to happen and come back and do a final walkthrough? Um, so I, at three, I'm in another committee in the Senate. Um, uh, so, but you're, you're talking today, right? I think we're ready to move this out today. And I would- Okay, just, I, I won't be able on. to have it edited uh, and, until probably ten, tonight or, uh, but I can probably uh, do the new language. Um, uh, so maybe, um, you know, and then I'm in another committee at 4.30. So uh, I can do this. I'm just, I, I just have a lot of, I'm, I'm not sure just yet, actually. <laughs> so um, because the other committees mark up too. So um, I'm trying to vote something out. Um, so are you, are you guys continuing to meet this afternoon? And then I can let you know, or you're not going to meet until you come back on this. My thought was that we would take a break and then come back to this. So if we can find a window in there where you think you'll be done um, and not needed in another committee, then we'll come back to it. And um, is it okay if I check? So uh, 
sorry, <laughs> I'm just not sure without checking with the other committee um, of how close they are. Uh, so how about we say it's three now, how about we say, uh, I actually, I don't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, talk well, with them. I don't, I don't want to commit to something when I'm already booked with them. I, so um, can I just email Andrea and let you know as soon as yep. I, with because I'm about to go into Senate Health and Welfare and I can see where they're at and they might be able to move quickly. And then you can have me the rest of the afternoon once I write this up. Okay. Sounds okay. like a plan. Sorry. Nope. That is quite all right. I mean, realize that you have to be in four places at once. On yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I will let Andrea know as soon as I can. Super. We will keep an eye out. Okay. You. Thank Thanks. you. All right. So committee, we are, um, we are ready to take a break for a few minutes, unless there are other things uh, that, that folks have on their list. Um, perhaps we could get an update on the nurse licensure compact path as well as how S15 is coming along. Go right ahead. Did you want to hear about the ways and means? Yes. Um, well, they, they, they haven't finished work on it yet. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the fees for nursing licenses and where it looks like they are um, landing is a uh, two, two levels of licenses. Um, one just for Vermonters who want a Vermont license and are not interested in getting the the license that covers them for the compact, and that would be less expensive. And then the other option would be um, to have the Vermont license and or, or the, the license that's uh, covered by the compact, including Vermont. Uh, there's, there's a lot of concern um, about making Vermont licenses even more expensive than they are now since they're already very high compared to other states. Uh, the challenge is though that, um, that as Lauren pointed out, the, the, the fees are based on what they need to, to, to make the, the books balance there. So there's um, a lot of back and forth on, on what, happens, what happens next there that they don't wanna run up a deficit for OPR, but they don't wanna raise the fees too high either. Sounds like they have the same concerns that we did. Yeah. Yep. Uh, questions for Rep Marwicki on this? Madam Chair. Go right ahead. Um, Mike, or Representative Marwicki, uh, was um, uh, Lauren Hebert, uh, uh, was she, um, how shall I say, um, consistent in her testimony uh, when we reviewed this question <clears throat> in the sense of giving some assurance that it would be at least a year, maybe it was two, before frankly that, uh, that decision had to be confronted? And if so, why would the Ways and Means <clears throat> not uh, simply allow a uh, revisitation of that at some, some date certain in the future? Well, uh, L Lauren was consistent. Uh, I'm not even going to attempt to try and answer for ways and means as to okay. why the various members were going in the direction they were. <clears throat> she she did reassure them though that there are there are ups and downs in the collections of the of the fees and um, but there seemed to be a, a lot of consternation about uh, running up a deficit and then having to come back again um, and having to change or raise fees at, at some point in the near future. Okay. 
Uh, Rep Lefebvre, you had your hand up before. Did you have a question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Anthony asked my question. <laughs> All right, so we will stay tuned on that one and um, and do our best to, to hope we find a path forward. So let's see, who else has been spending time in a money committee? Representative McCarthy. All right. Um, I know that I just found out that the Appropriations Committee did vote out S-15, uh, our uh, vote by mail and ballot curing uh, bill uh, 830 this afternoon. And so we'll be seeing, they also have an amendment that's coming. And I, I think that Representative Townsend will probably come and talk to us, but it just talks about where the one-time money is coming from. Um, so they're adding a new subsection that just clears up exactly where they want the Ser Secretary of State to find the money for the things like the drop boxes. Um, Madam Chair, do you want me to give a little summary of the couple of conversations we're having with folks? Okay. Yep, I think that would be helpful. So um, there's been some feedback now that we've got the bill out and it's uh, heading on, <laughs> on its way uh, to the floor uh, next week from um, some clerks, including uh, Representative Payala, uh, who just brought up a couple of, of issues. So one, um, which I th think should be pretty easy to uh, take a look at is the fact that in the bill um, around the secure Dropbox language, there's a requirement that the secure Dropboxes be closed at the end of business the day before election day. Um, and so there was a request and a conversation amongst a lot of town clerks. We got a lot of email feedback that they said, well, why can't we just keep those open later? And so uh, Director Senning is working on some language and, and with us around um, just adding a, a new line that would allow a BCA to uh, vote to keep those drop boxes open uh, as late as the close of the polls on election day, which is the practice that some towns did in 2020, is my understanding. So um, looking at that as a potential uh, amendment and then um, oh, Representative Anthony has his hand up. I don't know if, if you want me to- Do you have a question on that? Uh, well, I just recall uh, Clerk Dawes's uh, understanding Part of the problem was in uh, jurisdictions which have multiple boxes, uh, the staff may not be able to get to them all. So, all the boxes that is, if it's not the day before. One suggestion I recall that she made to me uh, in the context of our community, the box that's at the clerk's office, whether it's integral to the uh, front door or right outside, at least allows a compromise and you don't have to go chasing around for boxes that are maybe scattered all over town uh, because the clerk would essentially check that box last so that if that could stay open till say noon or one o'clock on election day that would probably fix it thanks yeah the this um the what we're considering and and um what i hope to present to you as a possible amendment uh it, would accomplish that, but it would really be permissive and allow the locals BCAs to do that. Um, so I think it accomplishes the same thing without us, you know, doing a whole nother page worth of legislation to spell it all out. Um, but recall that in the vast majority of towns, the secure drop box is going to just be at the polling place, which is the clerk's office. Um, and, and that there will only, because so many of our towns are so small, there'll likely only be one secure ballot drop box in, in a lot of those towns. Um, great. And then, and then the, the second issue is a little trickier. Uh, so we've received some feedback and uh, want to really be open to the concerns from some clerks regarding the language that we had in the five-day window before election day for ballot curing. And that's, um, oh gosh, I have it in my notes here. Where is this exactly? So um, this is in the notification requirements uh, section. 
So this is in section 13. And right now the language says that a clerk has to make a reasonable effort to contact the voter who, to notify them that their ballot was received but defective um, and that they do it from any information that they have on file. And there was some concern from clerks that voters might get treated differently, that, that, it, that it's unfair, that if it's somebody that the clerk knows or has a lot of information at the clerk's office, um, that that voter might be contacted, but that in a similar situation, another voter who didn't happen to have a phone number or an email on file wouldn't be. Um, the director setting has been really great in, in terms of talking with us about how they're gonna do a campaign to um, try to get even more folks to put their phone and email in the My Voter page, the online management system. And, um, and so we're trying to tighten up that language potentially and satisfy some of uh, the clerk's concerns, but um, still uh, have there be a requirement that there be a reasonable effort made to contact folks within that window where a postcard probably wouldn't get to them in time uh, for the voter to be able to cure the ballot. Brett yeah, Just as a, a tying into that, I'm, I'm guessing we're, we're, many of us are hearing from our, our town clerks and um, I have three of them that I represent. One of them uh, is sort of okay, one of them is just fine and one is just not happy at all and, and suggesting that this is gonna cause so much work, they're gonna have to hire extra staff. So, um, I guess there's a spectrum of, of chatter out there and um, not sure everybody's going to be happy, but um, I, I appreciate that uh, we seem to be trying to listen to that and, and do what we can. Yeah, I, I would say a couple of things, Representative Rowicki, that I, I've had several members, you know, email me or, or our chair here <laughs> about concerns. And there is a spectrum of opinion among clerks. And I think we heard a lot from their association representatives um, very much in favor of the bill, of course, right? So we heard that loud and clear. Um, but like any big organization, there's a diversity of opinion. Um, the, you know, a straight reading of all of the, these new instructions for clerks. If you just read the language for the first time, you might go, oh my gosh, there's all of this stuff to do. But the reality is, I mean, and we took testimony about the numbers of defective ballots. So in all of the state, all in the entire, you know, with all of the stuff that happened last year that was new, there were only about 1500 defective ballots that were reported. Um, and so that's not an exact number. It may be a little more or a little less, but um, you know, in St. Albans City, which is, you know, pretty large by Vermont standards, thousands and thousands of ballots cast in both the primary and the general, uh, my city clerk only saw 30 defective ballots. And most of those were during the primary where there was a relatively low number of total ballots returned compared to the general. So the, the idea that it's going to just mean so much additional work um, when the number of ballots that are actually received defected and might need to be notified as, as needing to be cured is pretty low. And the majority of those are going to come in um, before that five day window before election, right? So the experience that we heard from the clerks is that, you know, they'll um, be able to just mail the postcard and that'll be the way that they notify folks and, you know, put it in on the My Voter page. So if people are tracking their ballot, they'll be able to see, oh no, there's a problem with my ballot and have time to uh, cure the defect. Any other questions for Brett McCarthy on what he's been working on? Well, thank you for your great work on this. And I appreciate that that you're you're taking the lead so far outside the, the committee so that I could be here and um, and help continue our work on S25. So thank you for being uh, a good, a good team player on that and taking up a little extra slack. I appreciate it. All right, so I am going to recommend that we take a break and get off the computer for a little while. And I will keep an eye on, uh, on email um, 
and we will use email to signal when we're coming back into committee. Uh, obviously, if this turns into something that, you know, it looks like we won't get started until 430, then we can push this off till tomorrow. Uh, but if we can get back into committee um, before 430, I think we're ready to do a final walkthrough and vote on this bill. So uh, that is my aim. And um, so keep an eye on your email. Um, I'll try to poke you by text as well if I, um, if I have your cell phone and we will see if we can finish this um, this last major bill of the year for us. So. All right, see you in a little while.